All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I'm one of the co-hosts here. As always, I've got Andrew, the super sleuth of the show, uh, with us in studio. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well, man. This is a, a very exciting day. Yeah, exciting. so we have, uh, we're going to be talking about a cult that, since we started Cultish, we've got numerous messages uh, to cover it, and uh, it's, it, we always think whenever we're, we're talking about a specific cult, it'll happen right whenever, precisely when it's supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to be talking today about the World Mission Society Church of God. And so we're going to introduce our guests in just a moment, but we also have someone else with us in studio today. We have Josh Adent. Uh, tell them, tell everyone just a little bit about yourself. Hey, so um, I'm a member at Apologia, and I've known Andrew and Jerry for probably about a year and a half now. I was actually one of the people who was bugging Jerry about doing this one um, in person in his small group. Yes, I was one of them. And uh, so my, my wife and I moved to town about a year and a half ago so that I could study at Phoenix Seminary. So hey to all of you fellow seminary students out there. Yeah. And so, and specifically, you've had a lot of... Uh, not, you've done a lot of theological studies, but uh, specifically both uh, Andrew has, but also you have s- had some extensive interactions with people from the World Mission Society Church of God. And you can, you'd attest too that usually the, it's a pretty fiery conversation. They're pretty intense, right? Oh, it can definitely get fiery. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the case with you, with you, Andrew? Oh, yeah. It was, it was pretty intense. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying that because when we, uh, posted on our social media both uh, just a little while ago but also a couple weeks ago it was, it was right almost yeah it was when we first initially posted about it we had a lot of people most of the people commenting were talking about some sort of interaction that they had including here the audio of these two uh, college girls who interviewed in this uh, news clip here so all that being said we have a guest with us today um he is uh mike winger uh he is uh he's got a youtube channel bible thinker he's got a lot of great content uh definitely check out the youtube channel uh uh, Mike, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. <clears throat> it's really good. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm doing good. It's good to see see you guys digitally, I guess. And yes. it's good <laughs> to be with you, even though we originally were going to do this in person. Um, this is a lot more convenient for me. Thanks yes. to the coronavirus. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. This is uh, this is uh, we've changed from all these in-person meetings to Z- everyone's on almost everyone's doing Zoom for almost everything. So praise God for technology. Yes, it is pretty yeah. cool to see where things are at. So yeah, man, just uh, tell them just real quickly, just a little bit about yourself, your YouTube channel, and how and you because I know that when I started looking into myself about what is out there when it comes to the, the World Mission Society Church of God cult. There, there isn't really a lot of content, at least a Christian, a, a good Christian apologetic content. And that's where I came about your videos. But just tell everyone, how did you get into apologetics? Or tell, how did you get into your YouTube channel? And then tell them about what made you pay attention to the World Missing Society Church of God and start doing that on your YouTube channel. Yeah, well, I mean, the basic idea of my YouTube channel is uh, learning to think biblically about everything. And I cover topics of theology, apologetics, and I usually like to go a layer deeper than what you can usually find. Uh, At least that's my goal. That's my agenda. Study a little bit more in detail and then bring that detail out in the studies. And so I do verse by verse teaching and I do topical stuff as well, including things like cult groups and um, atheism and, you know, different stuff, historical issues about Christianity, all that kind of stuff. Uh, My main concern for my channel is trying to actually be biblical about things. A lot of guys Mm -hmm. who do apologetics stuff, they, in all honesty, they they just get a little disconnected from sort of that verse by verse mentality of Mm -hmm. understanding the text and context. Everything's more about, I mean, I have, I'm having a battle and I'm going to approach the the scripture with looking for tools for that battle. Mm. Uh, But I, but I want to make sure to have that, that holistic approach of understanding all of what the Bible is actually saying about things. Um, and the Lord's really blessed it. Um, I do these long videos where I teach all kinds of stuff in detail. And and I now have 138,000 subscribers, I think, right now. And awesome, it's man. just blowing my mind. I mean, I'm just mm-hmm. a, a pastor in Southern California who just I, I can't believe the reach that it has. And so I just want to be faithful with it. Try to do as much as I can for the kingdom, you know. Mm-hmm. Praise God, man. Yeah, like I've listened to quite a bit of your content. And I love it because you care about the person's soul that you're talking to, you know, like you just said, with the holistic approach that you you would take you take when actually addressing these issues. So I, I appreciate you and I appreciate your minist- uh, ministry, Pastor Mike, for cool. sure. Thank you. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm humbled by it. I, I don't deserve to have the voice that I've got right now, but mm-hmm. I hope I can use it well uh, and the Lord would bless it. Yeah. Amen. 
Yeah, man, definitely. Um, so just tell us real quickly. So you, you've mentioned that you, you did a lot of the different apologetic content and definitely check out his uh, YouTube channel at Bible Thinker. Um, but when it comes to the World Mission Society Church of God, what? how did you initially find out about them? Because you said you haven't had personal interactions with them, but explain what was the context that led you up to even making those videos to begin with? That when people go into, onto your YouTube channel, that now I've gotten tons of views on the World Mission Society Church of God. Yeah. Well, um, let me let me just tell you how it happened to me. I actually had a student who came up to me after a, after an encounter with the World Mission Society Church of God with some of their preachers, mm. and they came up to them and said, "Hey, have you heard of Mother God? Have you heard of God the Mother?" And then they brought him through this quickly, you know, just this drive by shooting of verses out of context, and then they totally tripped him up and he came to me and he was like, I don't, you know, he was just tripping out. He wasn't believing what they said, but he was like scared that they were right. And what tripped me out was how bad their, um, their Bible verses were for proving their points, but also how effective it seemed to be. Mm. Now I had another student come to me with the same thing and, and the same scenario like a year later and, and he's very worried and concerned. And I'm thinking, what what is going on with this group? So I decided to look into it, and as I look into it, I find that that they we'll talk about who what they believe and who they are and all that. But what I find is that there's like almost no resources online dealing with this group. I mean, if you type in Mormonism, you know, you've got tons of great resources online. Jehovah's Witnesses, tons of great resources, but World Mission Society, Church of God, it was like this vacuum where there was very little, especially <clears throat> especially you know a year and a half, two years ago, there was just very little out there, and they're growing. Um, in 2010, they claimed that they had uh, 1,900 churches, 1,900 churches, but currently they claim they have over 8,000. Wow. And they mm. say they've got 2.7 million registered members. And they've got a foothold in the U.S. They're on colleges near you, and they, they go under the names like Seven Thunders or ASEZ, A says, and they pretend they're just like a community service program mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to disguise what they're really doing. And there's, there's, um, there's just like these real strong movement on campuses. Um, they're in LA. They have a location here in LA. They they probably have one near you guys. I'm not sure. I didn't look into that, but they're very aggressive. And this seemed to me like the perfect time to target a cult group while they're young, while they're still relatively small and there's very little resources out there. Mm. We could have a huge impact if we just get this content out and get it out as quickly as possible. So I, I made my first video. I'll tell you real quick. My first video it, it, it did really well. It Within a very short period of time, a few days, it had, and this, my channel was smaller back then, but it had 10,000 views and people were leaving the church within days of me making this video. Mm, wow. And one lady, she was asked uh, by her fellow Church of God members, they call it the Church of God, that um, they asked her, why did, why did you leave? What happened? And they And she sent them my video. And in response, they filed this complaints against YouTube and have my video taken down. <laughs> And so it was only out for a few days and then the video was taken down and I couldn't, I couldn't fight it, just the dynamics and the politics of YouTube. So I made three more videos <laughs> this time, this time I made videos they couldn't take down because they didn't use any of their footage or any of their content. Mm -hmm. And the first one I made has got over a hundred thousand views and the other ones have good views as well. And the, the, a lot of people have left the group, thank God. Yeah through this. The feed, feedback has been really great. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, that when I was doing the research myself and I was kind of looking up some of their sermons and anything that was theirs, they had in caps all over. This is ours. This is our property. Like do not use. Yeah, <laughs> so I was, I was thinking in conjunction to the thing you said in your original video, I was like, I wonder how much influence Mike had on this. <laughs> well, they were already like that. They, they sue everybody oh, and wow. everybody knows it. It's, mm. and I had been warned when I first started covering them that they would come after me. And so I just tried to be very careful now because mm. um, I don't I don't want that content to be taken yeah. down. You know, one of the things I really loved about your video when you put it out is the awesome pictures that you put on there, Mike. Like the squirrel that made me laugh so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my tongue in cheek. I couldn't play footage from their video. I couldn't put up screenshots from their website. Like I don't want to take any chances, so I just put up like a picture of a squirrel or my cat. Yeah. And um Mox in a that box. Was, that's is my that dorky sense of humor. Yeah, and if and people are wondering like, well, well, what's the well, like what's that all about? Like what is that? I'm like, well, go check out the videos. That there's a soft plug right there, subtle for your to check out your content <laughs> Bible thinker. Um but it's really cool, man. I, I definitely agree with you as far as um, you know, a cult in its infancy, because a lot of times if you look at specifically a lot of the major cults that we're dealing with today started around the eighteen hundreds when you look at uh, Christian science, uh, Mormonism 
even in even in the most even in the last century you had Scientology uh, come come to rise up and besides from like Walter Martin there there really were not any real definitive Christian apologetics for how to answer these people and they would you know you think about what's going on right now in the world to get you as prior to you know you're in California and that around the LA area and things especially both in, are crazy in California but really all over the world right now but it's specifically it's the times like these of uncertainty is when cults will just jump in to recruit like crazy and mm. that's something you also have to do but you know one of the yeah. things you mentioned about not having resources is that um or just working, just you're having to collect the materials yourself. So one of uh, Walter Martin's messages, we played in one of our earlier uh, series. Uh, it was like interim episode called Walter Martin, The Baptism of Boldness. If you guys haven't checked that episode, listen to it. But one of the things that Walter Martin says is he said, you know, I literally for my first book, I, lo- I went to do a bibliography. My bibliography didn't, didn't exist. He goes, I had to go into a whole room, like all these cultic headquarters, and literally collect the materials for myself. And so he had to go and like find everything and pull it out. Mm -hmm. So with, and that's something similar to you did. So just real quickly, but you did a lot of research into this. I saw a post that you did where you had just a a couple of different books. There were somewhat original resources. So in some ways, some ways you kind of emulated one of my heroes of the faith, Walter Martin, with what he did. I love that. But Talk about just some of the books and resources that was in that post, and we'll post this on our social media when these episodes come out, about what you kind of delve into, not only for this episode, but your original videos. Tell us about those resources you've pulled into. Well, we'll we'll talk more about this a a little bit later when we talk about information control, Uh but... But the group does not let anybody outside the group have their books, and they work really hard to make sure you can't get them. Even if they do go on sale online, they will buy them up Mm. to keep you from getting them. So... What I do have, though, through through people who've left the group mostly, who've just given me their books, um, I've got six of their books right here, and I'm not supposed to have these. Like, I've been cursed by members of the group just for owning these books. Like, mm. literally, they, they send me curses. Mm. And um, these books um, in, include... I mean, they're, they're tough to read. It's difficult stuff. It's confusing, but it's all of the same vein. You start to realize how the people in the group are thinking because they're being trained with these books. They call them the truth books. Mm. And... Uh, this one in particular, the, the, they call the Green Book. This one's written actually um, by An Song Hong, the, the founder of the group itself. This stuff is – it's remarkable. I mean you could see that the original owner of the book, that she had all her notes. They study these things religiously. I mean this is all they do all day long. Well, what I had to do was try to figure out what this group really taught. I mean I know they had accusations that they were sex traffickers and stuff like that. <clears throat> you have to figure out what's really true about them versus right. what's – what's just, you know, leading in the news. <laughs> and and so um, that was part of the, the homework was to make sure that when I talk about the, the church of God, I speak about it in a way that the members go, yeah, that's right. That is what we believe. That is, that is what we think. Right. Otherwise, all my efforts are in vain. I'm training people to just build a straw man. Mm. So yeah, I've worked at trying to, to get these books and these resources and I want to get more. And uh, my, my, um, I'm going to give my address a little bit later. If anybody has books you want to send, I'll share my address for you guys to send it to me, uh, P.O. Box, because we really want to keep collecting these. I, I, I'm in contact with a few other people who are also working to create resources about this group. So, Okay. You know. Would it be fair to say, like, uh, as Christians, we would say the Bible is our objective standard, right? It's the Word of God. Would it be fair to say for um, people that are part of Wimscog, just real quickly, mm-hmm. like some of these books that you have, this would be uh, some type of standard that they would derive from on Song Hong. It's almost essentially scripture to them? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it essentially is scripture. Then the, the truth books, the specific ones called the truth books are essentially scripture. Then they have sermon books that are like a step down from that, but they're still carry the authority of the current prophet of the church. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's, it's, it's not like a pastoral commentary or something like that. It's way beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so, yeah. So what I we're curious to hear about, so a lot of people have had these encounters. You, like I said, you, uh, both of you guys have had, you, Josh, and uh, you, Andrew, you've, you've had encounters with them. And lots of our listening audience have also had encounters with them as well, too. And so um, a lot of us, a lot of times when, we, when we're dealing with a new cult, we, we like to kind of do a little bit of origins. Okay, where did this all start at? Right. So these people, there's an origin story to these people who go to the Targets and Walmarts and shopping malls and have these encounters talking about God the Mother. So I, one one thing I want to do. So Mike, we're going to have you kind of give a sort of like an overview of this, the little bit of the history behind this group and how they started. But mm-hmm. one of the things you'll see too, uh, this, we're kind of this is the first time we're delving into this cult. And while some of you may be new, be new to understanding this cult, is that 
there are definitive traits that you will always see, always definitive characteristics, right? So you'll have, typically you'll have someone who's somewhat of an authoritarian figure. Uh, they could be charismatic. And, but when you talk about theologically, it all, they always have some sort of authority where they put themselves above the Bible because they had some sort of private revelation where essentially there's lost and hidden knowledge. Well, let's just say the truth was there around the first century, but then it got lost at Nicaea, <laughs> right? So, and again, you can like, it's almost like a fill in the blanks cookie cutters. Like you could just swap and mm -hmm. replace it back and forth. You'll see it with Mormonism. You see the same claims made with Christian science. So you'll see these characteristics. So my, I already know that as you explain this, there's things that you will hear that will line up, for example, with Mormonism. Uh, things that line up with Scientology, those sort of characteristics. So I just want the listening audience to be aware of, we're wary of that as you uh, kind of listen to the origin story. But a lot of people kind of want to know about that. So tell us where where did this all start at? Because I know it was based it was based in Korea, and there was some influence on Seventh Day Adventism. Kind of had some sort of uh, undue influence on the beginning of the group. So take us back as far as you can to the very beginning. Let us know how how this craziness all started. All right. Well, in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning, there was a man named An Song Hong. And An Song Hong, uh, he was born in 1918, and he is the central figure of this group. Uh, he's the fountainhead of all of it, although the group has changed a lot since he was alive. Uh, he was a Buddhist. He was born in 1918. So he's born to non-Christian parents. He was a Buddhist. But in 1946, he was attending the SDA church, mm. Seventh-day Adventist. He was actually baptized by them. So he was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church, which implies that his theology was originally Seventh-day Adventist theology. Later, it totally changes. Um, in 1958, he gets married. April 5th, 1958, he marries someone. And here's something the members of the Church of God won't know. His wife's name was Hoang Wan Soon. And she stayed his wife. They never got divorced. Um, she passed away in 2008. On his tombstone are the names of his wife and his three children. So that this is important because we realize that that they've been taught different things about An Song Hong than the actual history. Now, in 1962, so just remember that he was married. Um, in 1962, he was kicked out of the SDA church. He was actually excommunicated from the church. That's really important to remember the date, 1962. This is important for later on. Mm. And he founded the Witnesses of Jesus Church of God in 1964. That was the name of the church. The church cha has changed names a lot of times uh, over the years. And so the current iteration of it is the World Mission Society Church of God. But when he first started his group, it was Witnesses of Jesus Church of God in 1964. At some point, he took a mistress and her name was Zengil Ja. Zengil Ja is still alive today. That is the Mother God character. But she wasn't Mother God yet. She was just his mistress, apparently. And he taught, here's some of the distinctives he taught uh, after he had been kicked out of the SDA church. He taught that Sunday worship is pagan and you have to worship on Saturday. Well, that mm. was actually part of the SDA stuff that he learned, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. He also taught crosses are pagan, Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, and basically every Christian in the world except for his group is pagan. That's a really significant part. Like cults, you know, generally do this. They say we're the only ones that have the true gospel. Right. It's just our little tiny group. Um, he also taught other things that didn't trace back to the SDA. He taught that we were originally angels in heaven who sinned. Some of us intentionally, some of us unintentionally, but we all sinned and we came down to earth. And that's, we just don't have a memory of our pre-existence. He also said he taught the Trinity, but in reality, he taught modalism. So he would call it the Trinity. He'd use the word Trinity, but then he would describe modalism. That, that is the father becomes the son who becomes the Holy Spirit. Mm. So one person, one being. And um, <clears throat> he seemed to think he was Elijah. Now, this is a little unclear. As you read his original writings, he strongly implies he's Elijah and that he is the second, the last coming of Elijah before the second coming of Christ. He really strongly implies this. It's in his writings, especially especially in the Green Book. Um, but but it's it's especially the original version of the Green Book, which we'll talk about later. And on his tombstone, even to this day, it actually says uh, on Song Hong, Elijah. So they even had written on his tombstone that he was Elijah. This is not, however, uh, consistent with the current theology of the church, at least not the way they want it to be. Mm. He taught that Jesus was coming back right away, but that this coming, <clears throat> it would start with a secret coming. And Jesus was going to was going to minister 37 years on earth in a secret fashion where, you know, people wouldn't see him. They wouldn't really know about him. Only like the sort of select Gnostic informed few <laughs> would be aware mm. of, of Jesus and his secret coming. Then the end was going to come. 
He also taught that he had restored Passover and that you can't be saved unless you observe Passover on the 14th day of the first month, according to the sacred calendar. Mm -hmm. And he would calculate when he thought that should be. And they would do it at twilight in the evening. That's an important thing for them, because if you don't do that, you're not saved. Mm -hmm. So it's a once a year special Passover ceremony that they do. He also taught, and this is not as widely known, that the end of the world was going to happen in 1988, that him and the believers with him would not die, but they would be transformed at that time. We'll talk more about that a little bit later because mm -hmm. that's problematic for the group. Uh, however, here's what happened with Aung San Hong, and here's where everything shifted. And, and the whole group it was one group split up into like three groups, actually, two that we'll talk about. He died in 1985 unexpectedly. On February 24th, he had a heart attack. Um, he, then he had a stroke, and then he died the next day, February 25th. And this was a total shocker that he didn't have health problems, that they, they didn't expect this to happen ahead of time. What happened in the wake of his death is there was this fighting for control of the cult. And it's split into two groups. And we do want to know about these two groups to understand the modern group today. Mm -hmm. One group is the NCPCOG. That stands for New Covenant Passover Church of God. That's where his wife and his three kids all went to be part of that group. And they claim to this day, even on their websites, they claim that they are the original, you know, have the original teachings of An Song Hong, and they publish it and they make it all available for free online. But it's mostly in Korean. Mm. Then the other group split off called the World Mission Society Church of God. That's the group that's been growing. That's the group that's evangelizing on campuses. This is the group that we're very concerned about today. And this is led by a man named Ju Chil Kim, who is their current prophet. And, and then you have Zeng Gil Jha, which was his mistress in real life. Now they're claiming that she is God the mother and that you have to believe in her and worship her in order to be saved. So let me give you a really brief overview, if I can, of the new group that we're concerned about today, the World Mission Society Church of God. They now teach that An Song Hong is the second coming of Christ, not just Elijah. He's Jesus come back. Mm. Now, they will say he's also Elijah. That's, but I think that's a relic, like a vestige of the fact that they're taking his teachings and evolving them into something that it, it, he wasn't originally teaching. So now he's actually Christ. Um, he's second coming Christ. They also teach he's the Father and the Holy Spirit because they have the whole modalism thing going on. They teach that he restored Passover, which is required for salvation. They add on to that that you have to tithe, you have to go to church a lot, you have to have the seven feasts, and you have to preach a lot, and you have to do a whole bunch of those things in order to be saved. Um, you have to, like for instance, you have to be in the building of the of the physical church. They call the Zion, the local church. You have to be in that building on mm -hmm. on the Sabbath, or else you could just be killed by going outside. Mm. It's yeah. pretty extreme stuff. Um, Mike, um, let me, can I ask you just something? Let me ask you something that just kind of caught my attention. So, yeah, we we've had episodes too on uh, one the UPCI, or a lot of times they're known as Oneist uh, Apostolic Pentecostals, and so they they're modalistic too in their views of the tri the Trinity, uh, mm -hmm. and they reject that. So, there's actually a really famous debate online. It if you look it up, it's Walter Martin and um, uh, Calvin. Calvin, Calvin Beisner. Calvin Beisner debating two guys from the UPCI. And so they're debating the doctrine of the, of the Trinity versus one a modalism. And with them is that they're making the same theological assumptions that the Father is the Son and they basically that they will go into a, like God the Father will go into a closet, put on a mask, become the Son, and then become the Holy Spirit, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. What is, it's similar, but what, it would make, what it makes it unique though is that they, they have a modalistic view but they're tying it into a their modern leader. So it's not so with someone who's one us apostolic, they're looking in the past and they're reinterpreting the incarnation. Like who Jesus was, what was his nature? He wasn't really fully God or fully man. He's the father who became the son. They're sort of dealing with it in the past via the testimony of of the gospels and the testimony of scripture. But it with here, and you can you can elaborate on this, Mike, it seems to be they're making those modalistic assumptions, but they're doing it with their uh, current leader, at least at that time, or or currently. Does that make sense? What I'm saying is that do you, yeah. is that what they're is that what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, I guess the way that I I categorize it in my head is I think of it as two just unrelated heresies that have mm. been combined. Yeah, one heresy is the modalism. The other heresy is that this guy on Song Hong is actually Jesus's secret second coming, and so the the modalism causes them to say <clears throat> that he's they even call him father on song home you know and they'll pray to him and pray in his name and baptize in his name um and 
and it gets really muddy because they also say, I mean, it's very confusing. They, they'll say that, um, you know, there's the age of the father. That's the old Testament, the age of the son. This is their theology, not mine. <laughs> that is, that is the new Testament time period. And then there's the age of the Holy spirit, which we know we're looking at Pentecost, right? But they say this age of the Holy spirit is when on song home comes mm-hmm. yet. He's, he's Jesus's second coming yet. He's the Holy spirit yet. They call him father. So it's just that it's all fuzzy and confused. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, Josh, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, cause if I remember correctly, listening to some of your videos, Mike, it seemed like there was kind of a delineation made between Christ and Jesus in in the World Mission Society Church of God. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, the only real difference between Jesus and 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 Christ is that I think that they say that Jesus is his name in his second coming. But An Song Hong is his name. I'm sorry, in his first coming. But An Song Hong is his name in his second coming. So they're they're both Christ and they're the same Christ. But there's two different names here. Hmm. And An Song Hong is seen as the, the name of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the age of the Holy Spirit. I know this sounds muddled, but it is muddled. It, it's, a, right. it's a theology that developed sort of haphazardly mm-hmm. uh, over time. And so, yeah, <clears throat> Jesus is the name of the Son. An Song Hong is the name of the Holy Spirit, which is the second coming Christ. Right. So, so with good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think this is this is one of the things that that kind of interests me specifically talking about the theology of Jesus. Right. Um, it, it, at this point, what do they do? You know, with a verse like in Colossians two nine, and if you want to talk about this later, let's just talk about it later. Um, wh- which says that in Him, in Christ Jesus, which is specifically said in. Colossians 2 6 the fullness of deity dwells bodily so what what do they do with that when Jesus wasn't on earth and then now he inherit like he, he inhabits a body again <clears throat> yeah I I asked about that I tried to press a, a former member we had who'd been a member for years and years and years and I asked him like what about the body of Jesus like Jesus comes back in a new body a different body as Christ on Song Hong in their theology. Mm-hmm. What happened to Jesus's original body? And then they, and now here's where you have to understand the power of ad hoc improvisational theology. <laughs> it's, I just make something up on the spot to rescue my bad theology. Mm. It doesn't arise from the scripture. It doesn't arise from good theology. It's just made up. So the, the ad hoc quick reaction is, oh, well, God's omnipresent. So maybe he's got two bodies. Yeah. And, yeah, and, w- and what you see, and what you'll see too, is a lot of times this is definitive cults too when they're when they're trained and taught how to argue their points, whether it be uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, or uh, World Mission Society, Church of God members, is that you're not taught to do chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and exegete out from the biblical text to understand what does the Bible actually say about this. So when I went to high school, Mike, it was uh, it was hello, it, here in Arizona where I live, and the school is 98% Mormon. So all of my friends, they would go across the street to their seminary training, and they would have what are called scripture mastery cards. And all they were is probably about, I would think they had maybe 20 to 25 of these cards, but they are all just me- passages they are supposed to memorize all separate from each other, and all sort of in isolation from the original context of the passage to prove a doctrinal point. So mm-hmm. that's one of the things you'll observe as well, too, in that. We'll definitely we'll definitely jump into some of the ways about how to deal with that in part two. But Yeah, we will. And yeah. I just want to say the point you're making is so valuable. Yes. They've 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 been taught to mishandle the text of scripture. And in many cases, people that are involved in cults, that's the only way they know how to read the Bible. They don't know even know how to look at a verse. And then back up and, and is examine the context. Mm-hmm. And that simple little, you know, trick of reading the whole chapter, you know, or the whole book um, just rescues people from many of the grips mm-hmm. of these cults. Yeah. And just one thing, too, we're going to we're in part two. We're, we're going we're going over the history and some of the psycholo- different aspects, uh, both theologically that would define the world missing society as a, as a cult. Then we're going to go to go into some of the uh, Stephen Hassan's bite model, which is uh, he's the author of combating cult mind control. He's a well-known cult expert. We'll talk about that as well, too. But a lot of times I'll just comment real quickly and then you can kind of go back into the history, Mike, is that when you're hearing sometimes the complex theology People sometimes, Christians will get overwhelmed about, okay, well, how do I learn all about their theology? But the reality is that a lot of times you don't need to get so, you don't so much to be, you need to become an expert on the world, yeah. Mr. Society, Church of God. 
as you are, you need to become an expert on your own Bible. Yep. And Walter Martin would say this too in one of his quotes. In fact, on your videos, Mike, you I saw in your background, you had Kingdom of the Cults in your library. And I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. um, one of the things that Walter Martin said is that um, he said, I urge you not to become an expert on all the cults. Become an expert. Become familiar with who the person of Jesus Christ is. And you'll never be deceived by anyone. It's the people who are unfamiliar are the ones who get sucked into the cults. So become familiar with the basic fundamental foundations of who God is, who Jesus is, how are you saved, what does scriptures come about him. And then when you start hearing something like this, this muddled theology, this is this is one of the first times I've really heard you explain this to me, Mike. But mm -hmm. I know it's muffled and I know it's bad, not because in any way I'm not an expert on this at all. That's why I'm having you on. But yeah. <laughs> the bait, my theology of, of who Jesus is, I already have a foundation of that. So it's almost you know, you're you're did, I'm familiar with the original and now I'm sort of running a counterfeit bill through my hands mm -hmm. and now it sticks out like a sore thumb. So I'll make that point and you can uh, and I'll let you jump back into it, Mike, unless there's anything you want to say in regards to that. No, I, I just think, yeah, amen to that. You know, you don't think you have to know all the stuff that I'm about to share in order to have a conversation with these people. It The knowledge does help. It increases our ability to communicate. It also helps us understand where they're coming from, which is really great for reaching out to them. Um, but okay, where I was at in my kind of review of the, my brief overview of the current teachings of the church of God mm -hmm. is, um, let's see, uh, Zen Gilja. So mother God, there is a God, the mother. Now, uh, this was not something that on song Hong taught. Uh, he did not teach it. He didn't think it. He actually taught against it. We'll get into that a little bit later. And it's now taught a uh, Ju Chil Kim in his book, God, God, the father and God, the mother, which I do have here, that particular book. He says this on page 185, without mother, there is no eternal life. Without mother, there is no truth. Those who do not believe in mother can't receive the promise of eternal life and the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. And let me add more weight to this on one of their hymns that they sing. They have like official church hymns and songs. And in their new song book, it's hymn number 145. It's called He Has Saved Me. But when you read the, the text, it's not what you think it is, right? It's a, the, the text of the song says this, even by the name of Jehovah, by the name of Jesus, oh, I could not be saved. Then it goes on to say this, on song Hong, he has saved me. And new Jerusalem, mother of love, she has saved me. Wow. So this stuff is pretty, pretty trippy. Now, what they had to do is they've actually had, and we'll talk more about this later if, you, if, if we have time. Yeah. Um, they had to actually change on song Hong's teachings. So the World Mission Society Church of God has to very carefully control which of his teachings they see. They take books, they edit them, they change them in order to support their mother God theology that he didn't have originally. Uh, that wasn't he wasn't interested in the mother God thing. He just was focused on the supposed sudden return of Christ that he was talking about. Now, there's actually a handwritten explanation of how on Song Hong from hand, uh, on Song Hong's own handwriting that's on a website. I'll, I'll give you guys a link for and you can maybe share it in your 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 notes. But it's in Korean. But I have had it translated. I got a translator to translate this for me. And he translated in the name of the Holy Father, the Holy Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. He baptized in that name. They baptize in the name of An Song Hong now. Mm -hmm. And you have to be baptized in his name. Yet An Song Hong baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. So this is a pretty significant difference. Yeah. Um, so there, there's like a brief overview of it. Mm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that... Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the being baptized in the name of Aung San Hong, and, and this is part of the uh, behavior control as far as, you know, thought indoctrination, you, you and we'll, we'll get into that. In fact, I'm jumping ahead here, but just jump back. It's kind of interesting, though, and you mentioned that almost in that hymn, you almost see where we're kind of jumping into. Almost, almost in that hymn, a characteristic a cult has where they sort of say one thing, but it's until later on until they introduce you to the deeper doctrines. So it's just kind of interesting that they said it was... Uh, what was the title of that hymn you said? He has saved me. He has saved me. But then it ends up a couple of verses or stanzas into it where it sort of mentions that it's really God the mother who's or she saved me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very, very telling part and parcel. So, so when we, just a, so that's the basic foundation. So we're looking at the theology. Uh, I'll let you jump in here, Andrew. We're, we're talking about um, it says that this is a, it would the World Mission Society Church of God would fall under the a counter would fall under a cult. Just because if you look at the terms as far as it being counterfeit Christianity, it borrows from Christian terminology. It pays lip service to the basic 
fundamental Orthodox Christianity, but it denies its fundamental tenets. So it's when you say, and this is really this is an example of any cultist. You you mention God, Jesus, salvation. You say any of those words, there's a language barrier, and that's one of the things that Walter Martin always talked about scaling that language barrier. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll definitely jump into that more as we go on. Andrew, what do you want to say here? Yeah, Pastor Mike, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, this real quick because we you briefly had discussed uh, God the Mother, and like there's a de- there's a developing of this idea, right? Like this isn't the first time. Uh, that this was heard about, like, uh, on wrote a book himself, right, refuting the idea of Mother God in 1980. But this is one of the books that is actually taken out of circulation, and mm-hmm. Wimscog doesn't want their their finders to, their, well, their members to actually read this book, correct? Like, there was a scandal uh, earlier in the church where there was a woman uh, claiming that she found a note in uh, On Song Hong's, like, like, bag talking about god the mother but he actually refuted the idea right just like he never claimed to be christ instead on his gravestone it says the the prophet elijah can you can you talk about that yeah this is so huge and so i will give you guys a link that you can share with people where you can read an english translation of on song hong's book it's called the new jerusalem and the bride interpretation on women's veil that's the english title from the from the korean it was published in 1980 a few years later, the World Mission Society, Church of God, they collected the books and will not let anybody read them. But mm-hmm. remember, they split into two groups, the NCP group, the smaller group that isn't really viral at all. <laughs> they publish it on their website and you can read it for free. Let me read to you some sections from this book. This is what Ansong Sung Hong himself actually taught about the, the idea of God the mother. And I'll just preface it with this. There was a woman named Um Suin. Um Suin is the one you talked about. She started proclaiming she was God the mother. And she says that she got this teaching from some secret teachings of Ansong Hong. So he confronts it in 1980 with the following. This is from the preface of the book. He says, and I quote, this booklet was published to prevent troublemakers who misinterpret and behave fanatically, explain the errors in the books that Um Suin published and testify of the unchanging truth of the church of our God. Un- no, so Ansong Hong, their, their central character, he thinks that this is an unchanging truth. Of course, World Mission Society Church of God has withheld this. They've changed it. In chapter 7, he says this. Um, this is a chapter called The Jerusalem in Heaven in Our Mother. Um Suin has then become the mother of Christ as well as the bride wife of Christ. How extremely scandalous is this? With this type of misguided delusion, she's become a false prophet and has attempted to gain power. Please think of what will become of her sin and the sin of those who follow after her. Now, on in chapter 8, uh, on uh, the chapter called New Jerusalem is real and material. It's literally saying New Jerusalem is not a, a, a female deity. He says this, the New Jerusalem, which is written of in Revelation 21, one through four, the tabernacle of God abides with human beings. However, this tabernacle is a spiritual building, not a person. And that's key to the church of God. Now they believe that she is the New Jerusalem. She is the mother God. And that's their proof text is Revelation 21. In chapter 11, he says the following, However, Um Suin is stating that the new heaven and new earth is here now, and the new Jerusalem is living now on this earth. Nobody, except someone who is not in their right state of mind, can believe and follow after this. Please think of this carefully. Now, here's here's a clincher for us, because Zheng Gilja, she was actually alive when he wrote this in 1980. Hmm. And he says nobody should who is in their right mind can believe that new Jerusalem is living now on the earth. Nobody can believe that. But yet she was alive on the earth at the time. Uh, One last quote from this book, uh, chapter 17. It's uh, it's about a curse. (laughs) And so it says, Um Suin claims that she is the only bride, the new heavens and the new Jerusalem. Through this, she becomes a queen and receives tithes that should be given to Melchizedek. That's part of his theology. She raises herself up as if she is greater than God. How arrogant and insolent an act is this? How long will God be patient with her? Again, it's out of print. It was collected by the group and they will not let their members see it. However, the rival group, New Covenant Passover, they realize that An Song Hong never taught this and they're trying to be faithful to his teachings, wrong as they were, and they publish it uh, freely online. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's really good. And again, this is... uh... The things you're saying is very good and very informative, especially for people uh, getting a good overview. And they can also check out the, you also talk more a lot about a lot of these things too on your videos too, on your YouTube channel over at Bible Thinker. But um, even some of the things you're saying too are falling in conjunction, because like I said, we already talked about it, how it fall as a theological cult. It, 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 like I said, it, denying the fundamental tenets of basic Christianity, 
and mm-hmm. having but coming out across as a counterfeit. But there's also definitive cultic characteristics. And here's one for example. He said you you, you have someone who had uh, started on a on an authoritative private revelation, but then he passed away. And then there's always this changing and progression. There's things that were supposed to be eternal and unchanging law, but now all of a sudden that goes and, and changes. Or they want a lot of times they'll do that. They'll make those changes, or say they'll they'll try and whitewash their history. Or just to make these people almost really flawless and presentable. And I always find that amusing, especially in contrast. If you look at the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you had people like Moses or people like Abraham just doing the dumbest stuff. Um, you know, you look at that. What was the story about? And he says, oh, tell tell Pharaoh that she's my that, uh, Abraham, that she's my yeah. sister. Yeah. And completely chickens out. You have Moses who gets angry at God. And he like breaks the staff up against when the water's coming out. And then he's not able to go to the promised land. And so you just have these people who are flawed. And those things are out in the open. I always find that contrast in contrast when they try and make these, these cult leaders these wonderful and holy and flawless people. Mm. Um, but so then I want to talk just real quickly about. Then this is something that a lot of there's a lot of content video contests. They'll talk about these categories. Um, other videos, what you would call them, secular vi- uh, non Christian views of the World Mission Society Church of God and calling it a cult. And they'll talk about these characteristics. But I don't think unless you really have a tr- embrace a true Christian worldview, you can't even give an accounting for why these things would be wrong. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, Mike, um, so Steve Hassan, he wrote a couple of excellent books. He uh, wrote a book called Freedom of Mind, and he also wrote a book called Combating Cult Mind Control. And so he had a unique uh, story. For anyone who don't know who he is, he got indoctrinated into the Moonies in college, and it was just a, a quick retreat, and he ended up getting, became a Moonie for two years, got out of the cult, and then he really almost became a completely different person by their indoctrination. So, but he gave kind of like a bite model, which explains very loosely a lot of the characteristics of cults. And so I'll just kind of label what they are. And then Mike, you can, you've kind of addressed this before already with some of the things about them, but bite stands for uh, four different characteristics, uh, behavior control, uh, information control. You mentioned that a little bit in regards to the books, uh, emotional mm-hmm. control, and thought control. So just in your time researching it, and also from the times you've talked with ex-members and things like that, give some examples of how you think the World Mission Society Church of God would fall into the bite model category with any of those four characteristics. Yeah, and, and I do have new information on this stuff because I, since I've last made videos on these, is, on these issues on this group, I have spoken with more former members. Oh, and wow. some of this stuff like behavioral control, you don't get that in the writings. The writings aren't going to tell you how do we treat people when they don't obey us? Like it doesn't say that. And so you have to talk to people to find this stuff out. So, um, here are some areas where they have behavioral control for one. It's time. Um, the amount of time that you have to be spending at Zion, they call it the Zion, their local, whatever their local uh, church gathering is, is pretty extensive. So on Saturday, the Sabbath, you, you must gather or you're you're going to hell if you don't attend. OK, this is a big deal. And you are there from, say, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. perhaps if you're not a leader. But if you're one who has blessings or responsibilities, you might be there from like 730 a.m. till midnight. I mean, that's and this is a big deal that you stay in the physical building during this time. Um, if you, you if one former member told a story how they were chopping onions. And the smell was making them cry. So she, so her and her friend left the building and stood right outside the front door. And the one who the deaconess who was chopping the the onions, she went to the edge of the door and pleaded with them, come inside, come inside. You're in danger. Come inside. Wow. Hmm. Right. That's that's a not a good environment to be in. It's real fear. Um, on Sundays, you think Sundays must be a day off. No, Sunday, you're there from like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. as well. All day. You have third day service. That's t- you have Tuesdays at the Zion. You're supposed to be there every Tuesday as well. Um, you're preaching three to four days a week. One of the that's where you go out and you're you you meet at the church and you go out and you preach and you get your training. You're supposed to study every day the different texts and the truth books and the and the the preaching skills that you're supposed to develop, like what verses to use, that kind of thing. Uh, One evening uh, a week is the Elohist Academy at Zion where you're getting that kind of training. Basically, every day of the week, you're you're supposed to go to the church after work, go preach and then go back to church. That's the regular week. You're supposed to study every day for a couple hours, one or two hours. And during feast weeks, because they they say they observe the seven feasts, but they don't do anything biblical on those days for the most part. They just go to the church. And but they have to be there on during those feast days, feast weeks, at five a.m. and at eight p.m. Those are two appointed times they have to show up at their uh, at their Zion. There's there's more though. 
that's just time. Um, there's arranged marriages in the church. I know mm. this sounds weird, but there really are arranging marriages a lot in the church. It's like a really highly reported phenomenon. And there's, there, you're not like, you know, you can't force someone to get married. Like not actually, right? But you can give them social consequences if they turn down your arranged marriage. And that's a really bad thing. When you spend every day, every waking moment, you're not, you know, at work, but pretty much in, in this group and part of this group and at this Zion location, the worst, and let me give you a quote from a former member. She said, the worst position to be in, in the church of God is when nobody rebukes you and they just leave you alone. This is devastating to a member. They've wrapped their whole life around the group and they're put in a place where they spend like 14 hours sitting alone at the Zion because nobody will talk to them Wow! because mm -hmm. they're giving them potentially this type of discipline um, for money, money manipulation. Uh, you're supposed to tie 10% to, as a starting point on everything. And this is on income and gifts. So here's a quote from a former member. She said, if my parents bought me a car, I would be expected to find out the value they paid for that car and to give 10% of that to the church. Now, this tithing is enforced. If you miss two weeks in a row, they will know because every other week you have to tithe at least every other week. Otherwise, you, you are no longer in good standing spiritually. You have to tithe for three months in order to join classes that will allow you to learn how to preach. You have to tithe for a year in order to meet God the mother if you want to go to Korea and meet the 76, 77-year-old woman, Zeng Gilja. Although they never use her name. Most members don't hear her name. Um, you have to tithe in most of the fellowships. You have to tithe for six months in order to get the green book. That's right. Six months of tithing just to buy the green book. So that's part of the control. But there's more. Let me <laughs> I'm giving you a lot, but there's more. There's it's it's widely reported that the church group encourages abortions. Abortions. And they and here's a quote from a church member who she says, This is what we say to each other. They say, We are living in the last days. You should be focused on the gospel work, not on a child. That it's actually selfish of you to bring a child, because they think the end is in coming imminently. You know, they've predicted it multiple times over the years. They think it's coming at any point. There's actually a woman right now who's suing the church, Michelle Rodriguez. She's currently suing the church for coercing her to get an abortion. And wow. that lawsuit is, is in court right now, or so I've been told. Um, so that's just the behavioral control. That's just the B of your bite model mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going on there. It's pretty extreme. Yeah. And, the, and then you mentioned, too, obviously information control, as you said before, just with them not allowing their members to or buying up the books, for example, they go for sale. Let me, let's do like a good almost like you like you said, you, you're in California. You know, they do the gun buyback programs. Right. And so trying to, you know, take whenever the, to counteract the violence going on. That's an example mm -hmm. when you have like how liberal governors will deal with just how they view their policy. But then they're trying to do that with their own materials, trying to get that back, not having people yeah. be able to see where it's you know, you should have, like with Christians, you should have your apologetic material out there. Like, critique it. Like, let us know. Let, let's let's do it. It's such a contrast, too, Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. as far as it goes. Andrew, what did you want to say real quickly? Yeah, I was going to say it makes sense, too, with um, how rigid their curriculum is, right? How much they have to do things over and over again. It makes sense that they push abortion, right? Because children will take up your time. Yeah, yeah. You know, they don't want their members to not be focused mainly on them and that and that's what worries me too like it's do you have peace with god like jesus gives us freedom right to be free of such a rigid requirement because he's god himself who fulfilled all of these things for us so if like you're in the wimscog right now and you're listening to this like there there's freedom you can be free from this mm -hmm. test test your prophet to what the scriptures say you know and there there, there's so much better out there for you and God loves you so much more than that. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's just one thing I'd like to, like to say that there's peace with God. Yeah, definitely. Josh, did you have any thoughts so far just in regards, just like the behavior control or information control that he was talking about? Is like, a, like anything on your mind as far as that goes? Oh, I mean, I've got some, some thoughts uh, as far as questions that we can probably address later as we dive into things a bit more theologically. Right. Um, but one of the things that seems interesting to me is, you know, I was talking to Andrew a bit briefly before this, and they've had previous um, end times prophecies before, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah. 1988, 1998, 2012. Those are the ones that I'm familiar with. I mean, and, and maybe this is just, a, I mean, this could be a conclusion that's not necessarily correct but i mean could it be that that's part of the reason why they're so heavy on evangelism in a sense because if they can't propagate their religion amongst their children because they're not having any 
they must have new members in order to actually grow their church from people who are already alive. Makes sense to me. I, I mean, to me, it's it's in a sense like certain. Yeah. It, it, well, yeah. they're they're so serious about growing their church through preaching, they call it, um, that this this was a shocker to me. They actually tell people not to evangelize the elderly or handicapped people. That these people are not, they, they can't be saved, that they sinned deliberately in, in their pre-existence and therefore they're cursed. That's why they're like that. And, and homosexuals too, not to evangelize them. And they, um, they just, they just cut them off. Like they're just, they're just not to be, in fact, if you try to invite a handicapped person to a service, the other members are going to be like, no, don't do that. Don't, we don't do that. Because now if you think about it as imagine if you just had a cold, heartless leader who only looks at you at the value you present to the organization of bringing more people in. Well, Mm -hmm. you're a handicapped person. Like, what are you going to do? How are you going to help us? They can't even You're fulfill elderly. the requirements. You're not going to be able to do all the preaching that we want you to do and attend all the services. Wow. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, to me, that screams the incident where Jesus runs into the man born blind and the disciples ask him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born mm-hmm. blind? And Jesus says, neither. I mean, that condemns their thinking right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, on the on the information control stuff, there is something more I'd like to share with you guys sure. if we have time for that here. Yeah. Yeah, I got a couple right. minutes. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So a few things that you want to know. Um, they, they say that the Internet is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that if you go online and you click an anti-church website or you, you search World Mission Society Church of God online, you will be eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I don't I don't want you to miss out on the psychological baggage that that brings. Right. That even researching on your own church, your cult group that you're part of, that even just researching it is like a life, eternal life destroying sin. Mm hmm. That's pretty significant. Yeah. You also can't buy their books. As I've said, the books that I've got, I, I got through means and ways, but uh, but you can't really buy them online. Um, even members have to earn the right to buy the books. But some of the books, they can't buy at all. Some stuff that An Song Hong wrote, they can't get. But I want to add this. They also edit the book. So this book, The Green Book, it's got 35 chapters. Mm-hmm. The original book by An Song Hong has 38 chapters. Mm-hmm. And you can read it, and I'll give you guys the link. You can put it in your your video description or whatever. This actually has the 38 chapter version in English and Korean on their website, on the uh, New Covenant Passover, the split off group. Mm-hmm. In those chapters, it's not that hard to figure out why they removed them. Two of them in particular. The first chapter was called the was was uh, about the end of the world in 1988. Let me just read to you. This is a quote from page 14 of the original On Song Hong Green Book, chapter one, the original chapter one. He says, since the Israel nation came into independence in 1948, it makes 1988 40 years after. Will the world really come to an end at that time? And then he goes on and says, it will surely come to an end at that time. Now, the other chapter, one of the other chapters they deleted is chapter 36 called Elijah will be sent. Now, this is really significant because An Sung Hong was like obsessed with this prophecy about Elijah coming. But the World Mission Society Church of God, they will not talk about Elijah. You go to their website, you search Elijah, you look for Elijah on their material, you can't find it. They deleted the chapter about Elijah, but here's what An Song Hong actually wrote. Page 220, he said, Therefore, as John the Baptist was sent by Elijah's calling to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus, he sent Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus' return, who would guide starving and struggling people to the fountain of life by the truth. He goes on to talk about how uh, we'll know it's Elijah because he'll bring the Passover. He'll restore Passover, which is what An Sung Hong did. Here he's implying that he's Elijah, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But then on page 223, he says this. Remember, he said 1988, the end, of the, the end of the world. Well, on page 223, he says, because the first actual Elijah had ascended when he was alive, 2 Kings 2.11, the last Elijah's mission is to transform and ascend while he is alive. The last Elijah's mission is to transform and ascend along with the live 144,000 saints. Wow. So you can see why they had to delete this. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because it's a prophecy about him and his followers ascending in 1988. Mm-hmm. And so they just delete those things. Now, there's other places where they make changes. I won't get into all the details for the sake of time, but they change things like the tense where um, An Sung Hong is writing about Jesus will come and they'll change the tense. So it says Jesus has come. Mm-hmm. And they do that as well. That's in, on page 124 of, of their version um, of the book. So you might ask, though, well, which one's original? Maybe maybe the World Mission Society has the real one and the New Covenant Passover Church, they have the fake versions. Mm-hmm. But, but here's the trippy thing. The World Mission Society is like the most litigious 
cult I've ever seen. They sue everybody for everything. And the New Covenant Passover, they're just putting these books out for free online for everybody. Hmm. The World Mission Society has a copyright to some later version of the book. If they own the books, can't they just sue the New Covenant Passover and have them take the books down? I mean, they certainly would like to, but they they, they can't because they are just the real books as they originally were. Hmm. No, that's huge, man. That's that's really good. And again, this is just another example of what you see. And really, this is a, really one of the ways to really deal with the cults in many ways is one to almost use their own history and materials against them. Like Walter Martin gives the gives the illustration about when after David hit Goliath with his, sl- uh, his slingshot and his how many how many smooth stones did he have? Five. Five. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You said I asked the same area guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but one of the things he said he did. One of the things that David did is he took Goliath's own sword, yep. and chopped off his head. Amen. So in the in the same sense, um, and then this is metaphorically, we're not implying violence in any way here. So just just I want any any like members that get all worked up about that. But it's like you're using their own materials against them, and you're essentially in a very metaphorical sense, you're allowing them to fall on their own sword because their own the that doesn't hold up to they're they're claiming the authority of mm-hmm. Ansel Hong, for example. But again, when you start delving into the theology, their current assumptions contradict the previous pe- the re- original materials to which they're ap- appealing authority to. And you see that too in Mormonism. Yeah. A lot of times when we'd go out to the Mormon temple, we would have photocopies of a lot of their original documents of writings of Joseph Smith or of Brigham Young. And then they would say like, there's a book. We actually have this uh, book called, where does it say that? Because mm-hmm. literally <laughs> you would quote something from Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. And they would say, where does it say that? Where does like, it say that? Well, <laughs> I have book. a book called, where does it say that? What a, <laughs> yep. how convenient. So yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's, and the reason you had to bring that book to the Mormons is the same reason I'm bringing this content to this video yes. and this podcast is because I'm not just doing this for Christians who are curious about another cult. I want the members of the group to be influenced. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to influence them, we should meet them where they're at and show them even in their own writings, even in their own literature, how they've been deceived. They're, they're, they're the victims of a, of a horrible deceit. And mm-hmm. I want them to realize that and using their own stuff uh, meets them where they're at. Right. And I, and I want to I want to point out to you if anyone's listening and you've you've still hung in there and you're part of uh, the World Mission Society Church of God when we bring up a false prophecy there's a reason why and you may have never heard of this passage of scripture there's two tests of a prophet in scripture there's Deuteronomy 13 and then Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 18 verse 20 through 22 says as it says but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks the name of other gods that same prophet shall die and it says and if you say in your heart how may we know the Lord the word that the Lord has not spoken. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. That may be the first time you've ever heard that passage in your life. Mm -hmm. So look at your own source material. Like uh, pastor Mike said, like we're saying here, Mm -hmm. has your, has your prophet spoken presumptuously? Do you not have peace with God? Is there a reason for that? T- mm. Test him to scripture. You can have peace with God today by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the eternal God who died on the on the cross for your sins. Yes, absolutely. And one last thing, uh, uh, Josh. One last uh, thought, and then we'll wrap things up here. What, what, what was the thing that was on your mind? Well, what I what I noticed is that you know when you're talking about the the inconsistency and the changes that occur, you know, from the original to what's out now, and how many members don't realize this, or some may may realize it as they stumble across this information what's interesting to me is that shows the amazing continuity in scripture amen that is found in no other religion every other religion especially when they start trying to add to the bible by in their corpus of scripture there's always contradiction problems not so with the bible that speaks to the supernatural nature <laughs> of scripture love it and the uh human origin of everything else amen very yeah. good very amen. well hey, said let me, let me throw this out there real quick because yeah. i forgot to say it earlier For sure. but, um if you're a former member you're listening to this and you and you have got these resources and the books and materials please send them to me at p.o box 39 bellflower california 90707 and i will be or you can contact me through my website biblethinker.org i'll pay for the shipping that's fine. I, I want to collect these resources so we can continue to produce content to help people out who have been where you've been. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So uh, we've gone a little bit, and this is sort of a good introduction to the World Mission Society Church of God. I believe in the next segment, we are going to uh, continue our conversation with Mike Winger. Uh, we're going to be kind of talking about some of the kind of the nitty, kind of like the nuts and bolts and the nitty, nitty gritty when it comes to the theology and the presumptions that someone has if you're at it, if you're going to one of those essential business places like Target or Walmart or those, and you're going there and you run into uh, them I'd, if they're doing, if they're selling you to evangelism right now, given current circumstances, but they're, whatever they're doing, you're going to run into them. Like, what are the, what are, what are the things that they bring up? What are their presumptions? How do we actually answer them? How, and this is almost an example too, when you're talking to a cultist, there's things you have to take into account about what the mindset of someone is who's into a cult like that. What's their mindset? How do you approach them? What's the way for them to lower down their defenses? These are the things you got to take into consideration when you're talking to a cultist. We're going to kind of jump into that in the next episode. So uh, thank you guys so, so much for listening. And if you want to check out uh, Mike Winger's material, definitely check out Bible Thinker uh, on his YouTube channel. He has a lot of great material. It covers a broad variety of topics. Also, uh, make sure that you check out uh, our new after show called Cultish the Aftermath. We'll do an aftermath on this episode talking about God the Mother. And check that out if you go to Apologia Studios, uh, join All Access. Uh, Cultish the Aftermath is one of the many uh, additional programs that there's a lot of other great theological training and content on Apologia All Access as well. Definitely check out the Cultish the Aftermath. Also, this program cannot continue without your support. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, if you want to uh, be part of the Cultish crew, allow this program to continue so we can have great conversations like the one we're having here with Mike Winger, uh, go to thecultishshow.com, go to the Donate tab, donate one time or monthly, and help us continue being salt and light during these crazy and uncertain times. So all that being said, thank you all for listening in. Thank you so much for uh, supporting us and listening in. We will talk to you next time in part two, where we enter into the Kingdom of the Cults, talking about the World Mission Society Church of God in the next segment. Talk to you all soon.